Hello family, welcome to Every Nation Faith Studies online service and today we have a special surprise for you. My name is Reinhard and I have the privilege of just telling you what we are going to do today. And not only today, but for the coming few weeks and we're going to do the following. We as Every Nation Faith Study are part of a global family of Every Nation Church, churches around the globe. And we recently had the privilege in Cape Town to join the World Conference, it was called the GO Conference, where 71 nations gathered together worshiping God and giving glory to Him. I hope you're excited because I am. Remember, take notes, grab a cup of coffee and share it with a friend. I want to echo everything that the previous speakers have said. I join in union to say thank you uh, to all of the leaders for the opportunity to share God's word. They know this, but I just wanted to say it out loud because honor is important to me. I know that I'm standing in comfort because of someone else's inconvenience. And so thank you. And then to the South African team, Wow. Wow. Thank you. It's good to be home. And if you don't understand what I'm saying, I'm going to explain it to you. I like to call myself Niger American. I was born in the US, but raised in Nigeria because that is where I'm from. My name is Olashibomi, formerly Awokoya, now Roberson. Left Nigeria, came to America, met the love of my life, who puts up with me. And God's blessed us with a wonderful family. And so this is important for you to know because when I start to share God's word, I get a little passionate and then my accent goes from American accent to Nigerian accent, okay? I promise I'm not schizophrenic. <laughs> I'm just Niger American. In July, one of our staff members, who's also his wife is a friend, sent us a text. I say us because she sent it to myself and some of our elders and deacons at our church back in North Carolina. And she said, please pray. I went to the doctor this morning for a normal checkup. She was in the last trimester of her pregnancy. And at this point was just going for the regular weekly checkup. She went in, but came out with some news that was very disturbing. You see, before she sent that text in July, she had shared with me months before and mentioned that they had told her she had a condition. It's placenta priva, which means that the bag that God's created to provide nourishment to the baby while in the womb has now become a threat to the baby. But thank God for medical intervention. They know how to, we, our prayer was we were praying that everything would resolve, resolve. But now not only did that not resolve, but this same bag was now a threat to her. And so the options they gave her were this. You have a hysterectomy, meaning you're not going to have any kids after this, or you could lose your life. And this is a woman that has just, she, she said to me, I was just getting so excited about having more kids. I don't know about you, but that is what it feels like to be between a rock and a hard place. And so I received this text in July, and I was, as the shepherd, the leader, the friend, I was going to send her a message or give her a call, and I started to rehearse in my mind what I was going to say. You see, because as a leader, you have to watch what you say so you don't set expectations too high. Or at least that's what I thought. Because I just didn't know how it would go. So I was rehearsing in my mind 
okay, and maybe I'll tell her, look, whatever happens, God is still good. We're going to believe. And I'm playing all this, and I lift up my phone to give her a call. I'm dialing her number. The Holy Spirit stops me. And he says to me, here you are, steeping yourself in John 11 in preparation for the World Conference, the Gold Conference, to talk about faith for miracles. And you are cowering behind fear that maybe God would not come through. And then he asked, when, anytime the Holy Spirit asks a question, it's rhetorical. You don't answer. And then he says, could it be that the Lord has allowed this, just wants to use this to reveal his glory to her and to honor his name and you can see his power. Y'all, I lifted up that phone. I said, listen, we are gonna believe God today. We are going to trust him that not only would you give birth to this baby, but you will have more if you so choose according to the will of God. But I wasn't the only one praying. There were all of us joining together in prayer. And a week later, if we could show up that picture, show that picture. <laughs> baby Justice and Renetta are doing very well. Homeboy can eat is what I've been told. But I learned a lesson. I learned a lesson. You see, sometimes when we find ourselves in situations, the first thing that we want to do is fall into default settings that are contrary to the word of God. We want to look for answers. We want to fix it. We allow anxiety to begin to speak to us, but we must know that dire situations, desperate circumstances will always precede miracles. But that should be a clue that God perhaps wants to use as an opportunity to reveal who he is to us, but not just to us, for others so that they can believe in him. So the lesson that I learned is that there's faith for miracles today but it is ignited by hearing a word of God and sustained by a belief in Jesus. There is faith for miracles today, and it is ignited by hearing the word of God and sustained by belief in Jesus. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you want to do something new this morning. And I ask that none of us will miss it. Lord, take this word, multiply it however you so choose. But by the time you are done, Lord, we ask that we will walk out of those doors and we will never be the same. And we thank you, Lord, for every situation that is represented in this room and in the overflow room. And we are asking, Father, for faith, to see you do a miracle that points to you, Son of God, that we might give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, the reason why I was afraid at first was because there was fear. And the Bible says that perfect love casts out all fear. So when I feel afraid, it's because in that moment, I am not receiving or understanding or seeing love in the way that I should. And so what I'm doing in that moment is I'm looking at God's love from the lens of my circumstances instead of looking at my circumstances from the lens of God's love. See, when you understand how much God loves you, what happens is then there's no room for fear. It actually invites faith. We see this in the context, in the main text that I want to share with you, which is out of John chapter 11. I'm going to read, I'm going to read the, the text I'm reading is actually what I like to call the hinging point, but I'm going to walk you through this chapter from chapter, from verse 1 all the way to verse 45. But in John chapter 11, verse 17, this is what happened. 
When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Everyone say four days. We got to remember that. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to him. But Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus, if only you had been here, I may have received my visa. Jesus, if only you had been here, maybe we would have gotten the building for the church. Jesus, if you had come when we asked you, maybe this relational dysfunction in our staff or with whatever challenge is happening may not have happened. Verse 22, but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were friends of Jesus. Jesus would come to Bethany, recline in their home. They had not just a high acquaintance relationship, it was a, there was a fondness. And so when their brother Lazarus was not feeling well and it did not look good, it did not look good at all, they sent word to Jesus. They pulled the influence card. I know someone somewhere in high places, so I'm going to call on that person. But when they got to G, when the message got to Jesus in verse 4, listen to what Jesus says. He says, but when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. And then I want to point, he says, although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. This is Jesus who when a synagogue leader told him to come pray for his daughter who was very sick, that was Jairus. He, he, this is a synagogue leader. Synagogue leaders did not like Jesus. But the synagogue, Jesus, synagogue leader, excuse me, goes to Jesus and it says immediately Jesus goes to Jairus' house. Even on the way to Jairus' house, a woman who is desperate for 12 years had dealt with an issue with blood, touches the hem of his garment. She's healed instantly. He stops to minister to her, and then he goes to Jairus' house where he actually raises his daughter from the dead because she dies from the sickness right at that, in, in the moment that Jesus is ministering to the woman with the issue of blood. This, this is a Jesus that they're talking to come, and he stays two days on purpose. Not quite related, but maybe related to my message. This is a word of encouragement for you. Sometimes divine delays are for divine appointments. Just because he did not show up does not mean he did not hear about it and that he doesn't have a plan. And so in this moment, they're like, I mean, they had a relationship. They said, the one whom you love, the one whom you hang out with, the one who knows you, the one who calls on your name, the one you love to spend time with is sick and Jesus waits for two days. But here's what I want you to catch in this. When the message came to Jesus, Jesus spoke. Jesus had something to say, which brings me to the very first point, that faith is ignited by hearing the word of God. Do you know that God has something to say about your difficult situation? Do you know he has an opinion? But see, the problem is when something happens, as I said earlier, instead of going into the word, what happens is we go to our friends, we go on social media, we search Google, we listen to the news, we listen to past experiences, and then we begin to filter our situation based on that. But Jesus has a word. And he has a word because the word with the words, let me break this down for you. 
You see, John, the, in the gospel, John's intent in writing the gospel is he's showing us that, he's proving us that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and he's using different specific miracles to show us that. But when he starts his gospel, he starts in the very first chapter, he begins to define who Jesus is. And he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was with God, and the Word was God. And he goes all the way down to verse 14, and then he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is the embodiment of God's Word. And then in Hebrews 4.12, he goes on to say that the word is living and active and powerful. So when you hear the word of God, it's supposed to be doing something in you. But he doesn't just stop there. In Romans 10, 17, it says then faith comes by hearing and hearing this living, this powerful, this active word. So that's why it's important that we hear what Jesus is saying. So in this situation, Jesus indicates and has already said what he was going to do and the purpose for what he was doing in this situation. God has something to say about the predicament that you're in. Some of you came to this conference and you're like, God, if you don't show up, I don't know what's going to happen. You're dealing with marital challenges that nobody knows. Your children are not where you had hoped and expected them to be. In fact, some of you are dealing with some desperate situations, managing your text messages right now. But God has a word. You see, the challenge is in addition to maybe listening, to other things, instead of going to the word of God first, is this, is that we allow other things to begin to help inter interpret what's going on. You see, my, my, my second son started a new school recently, and um, his teacher sent us an email and said to us, please, we'd like to have a meeting with you, and I'm not going to lie, I was so nervous. I didn't know what they were going to tell me. He's not a good fit for this school because he was already faith getting into that school. It's a great school. So we sit down in that meeting and all they do is just encourage us about our son. And they're just speaking amazing things. I am so encouraged. I'm in that moment just locked in. But my husband notices one teacher and he says, ooh, she's got something else to say. Eventually she pipes up and she goes, yes, everything they're saying about him is true. Um, but you know, he, he talks a lot in class and he doesn't get his work done. And, uh, and sometimes it's distracting. And I let them talk in class, but it's more to collab, it's more to do work. And we said, okay, it's okay to talk to him. Now, remember I said I'm Nigerian-American? So I got home and I flipped. Because I know all your teachers can say good things, but if one says one thing, now you know that's not where you're supposed to be. So after dinner, I said, David, we met with your teachers today. And I've already switched to my Nigerian accent. So you already know, it's like, oh, Lord. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, your teacher said that you're talking in class. And he goes, mommy, we're supposed to talk. She says we can talk. That's why I'm talking. And I said, but David, you're distracting other people. And you're supposed to be doing your work. She said, he said, I'm doing my work. And in that moment, it's almost like the Holy Spirit opened my eyes. And I began to realize the teacher said talk. And my son did hear talk. But the teacher's definition of talking was completely different than my son's interpretation of talking. So it was the same word talking, but completely missed expectations. You see, sometimes we hear God's voice. We hear what he's saying, but we bring in our past knowledge. We watch other people's stories. We think about our past situation. We begin to filter what God is saying instead of really hearing what he has to say. We have to lay aside sometimes what we know. You know what key hinders faith? It's knowledge. The more knowledge you have, the less faith, unless by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why I appreciated what Pastor Siviwe and Pastor Tim said yesterday. By my spirit, and the word needs to come forward so the Holy Spirit can begin to move. But see, 
The disciples, when you're going into the rest of the chapter, they too did not understand what Jesus is saying because in, in verse 11, Jesus tells his disciples, after two days, he says, come on, we're going to go wake up Lazarus up. And they're like, oh, if he's waking up, why do we need to go? And he goes, and then he tells them plainly, Jesus tells them plainly, he died. In verse 4, he just said his sickness will not end in death. And then he died. Sometimes, and that's why we need faith, what looks dead to us is dormant to Jesus. And they still don't get it. That's why they were concerned about Jesus getting stoned, if you read the story. They were taking previous experiences and filtering the word of God. But someone else that does this is also Martha. Because Jesus comes to her. Which brings me to my second point, which is that we can't just hear the word, but we need to believe. There has to be believing, an ongoing action. He comes, Martha comes to him. She says, if you were, if you had been here. And then in that moment, Jesus says, do you believe? that your brother will rise again. And Mary begins to tell Jesus what she knows. She says, you're the Messiah, the son of God. Yes, I believe he will rise with all of us on that day. And then Jesus in that moment now tells her something, who he is in a new way. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And Martha still misses it. You see, when we get the word of God, what we must do with it is not just hear it, but we need to take that word and we need to repeat it over and over again and allow the Holy Spirit to begin to minister to us. We need to take that word and begin to pray it. Because you see, in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says we walk by faith and not by sight. It also says in the New Living Translation, it says we live by believing and not by what we see. And so when as you begin to take that word, whatever it is about your circumstance, about your situation, whatever miracle you're believing for, and God is giving you a word, even when everything around you looks completely different from what you know but you begin to speak that word you begin to say it out you begin to profess it you begin to pray it you begin to tell people even when people that you love sometimes might say something contrary to what you know that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and quality Bible believing spirit-filled believers that are around you in your community attest to and the Bible also says you begin to speak it out now sometimes the word is from the Bible which is primary the logo but maybe it's a rema word too that you've received an impression from the Holy Spirit that is also boundaried by the logos and you begin to remind God Jesus this is what you said this is what you said you would do I know that it looks differently but I know you will never fail me you said you would not abandon us to Sheol because your word is primary because I know you're not a man that shall lie I'm going to hold on to this word you see when we begin to believe the word something happens to us and what happens is that there is faith that is ignited and all of a sudden we begin to see from God's perspective. Most, I don't know if most of you would do this, but we are new to South Africa, so we did everything that every tourist would do. So we went to Table Mountain. If you haven't done it, it's beautiful. But here's my point. We were driving up Table Mountain and we saw a lion's head. And I remember my husband and I were talking, I was thinking to myself, why will anybody want to hike up that mountain? <laughs> Absolutely not. But if you love it, God bless you, you are, you're my hero. I just want you to know I'm just going to live vicariously through you because I ain't doing it. And so we see lion's head, it's huge, steep, it's big. And then we get on the cable car because, you know, I'm not hiking Table Mountain. And we go up, and we go up. And we go up and we get to the top. And we walk just a few yards and I look to my left. First of all, I see the whole cape and it's beautiful. The water, the landscape, gorgeous. God is creative. I mean, he's so creative. And I look down, 
But then I look to my left, and Lion's Head is just right here. And I'm like, you mean Lion's Head is shorter than Table Mountain? You see, I wouldn't have known it unless I was elevated so that I could see that perspective. You see, sometimes our, our situation, the things, the desperate, dire circumstances, they look like lion's head. But when you get the word of God in you, when you begin to believe the promises of God, when you begin to pray it out, all of a sudden, you just rise up to the perspective of God Almighty. And that thing looks so small, so puny, so possible. Why? Because now you have the word of God in you and you are beginning to see from the perspective of the Holy Spirit. And you're not intimidated. If I sound a little passionate, it's because there are some things in my life and I'm looking at them right now and I'm saying, not today. Not today and not ever. You see, when we get that word in our lives, we begin to see, you know what's interesting? Jesus consoles Martha and then he says, where is Lazarus? They take him there. And he tells them, roll the stone. In fact, let's go, let's go, let's go there. Verse 38, John 11. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. A cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested. Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands, feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told him, unwrap him and let him go. Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. So you see, Mary is working out her believing. And then it gets to the point where now she has to act in faith. And Jesus has rolled the stone. And she goes, ah, uh, no, ah, uh, ah, uh, no. Uh, it's going to be smelling. And he says something. This is going to be smelling because it's decomposed. Some of you are, God is sending you to different countries, but you're dealing with immigration issues. You've been denied. And you've said to yourself, it's over. Some of you, God's calling you to start businesses so that his kingdom can advance. But for whatever reason, one hiccup after another, something resisting, something pushing, something preventing. But the word of the Lord is, roll the stone. Go again. Ask them again. You're believing for a building. The bank told you no. You've been disapproved. But yet there's something in you that says, ask one more time. And you're saying, they're going to throw me out. And Jesus is saying, ask one more time. Roll the stone. But here's what Jesus said. He asked her, he says, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see? You believe and you see. You don't see and believe in the kingdom of God. You believe and you see. It says that, and then she obeyed. And then, then, that's when Jesus stood and said, Lazarus, come out. Listen, we need to get the word of God to ignite faith. We need to then allow that faith say sustained by believing that word, prophesying that word, confessing that word, allowing God carry us from our little perspective where everything looks so big, everything looks so impossible to elevate us to a higher perspective. And doing so would help us to understand that this thing that we need a miracle for is not an opposition. It is an opportunity for Jesus to step in, for Jesus to do something that we have never seen him do. See, a lot of times we go into these situations with our own frame of reference of what has already happened. But Jesus wants to do something new. Martha and Mary had faith for Jesus to heal Lazarus. I wonder if they had faith that he would actually raise him from the dead. He wants to do something new. 
The reason why I had you all say four days is because there was a superstition, a Jewish superstition, that after three days when the body died, for three days if, when the, body, the dead body's there, that the spirit of the dead body will hover. But after four days, the, the, the body spirit will leave and there was no return. That's when Jesus wanted to show up because he wanted to show the world that he has authority over life and death. So what is decomposed? What is said to be disapproved? What is said to be no more? What is said to be irreversible? What is said to be irreparable? That he has the power, he has the authority to change the narrative, to change the story. It's not over just because some man said it's over. It's not over because of some person said it's over. He has and always will have the final say. And when he calls Lazarus out, it says he came out. That's why John put it, his hands and feet bound. There was no decomposition or decomposition, whatever it is. He came out whole. He came out full. He came out repaired. He came out whole. As I wrap this up, but what I love and has ministered to me in this text is one, the reminder that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And he wants to resurrect some dead things in you. So looking at your situation, don't give up. But here's what I love. Do you know that Jesus never went into the village? It says he stayed outside of the village. Why did he stay outside of the village? You see, in Jewish culture, when someone died, because that body, the body was considered unclean. So they took the body out to bury the body in a cave outside of the village. Jesus never went into the village. He went to where the problem was. He was standing. He knew what he was doing. Family, he knew what he was doing. He knew from the beginning. So whatever it is that you're dealing, and that's, here's the deal. Martha and Mary went to meet him there. So wherever and whatever your situation is, if it's a marriage, if you're believing for children, if you're believing for your children to really follow the Lord and have an encounter with him, if you're believing for healing in your body, if you're believing for someone in your church to be healed supernaturally, if you're believing for breakthrough in your business, breakthrough in your finances, you are believing God to pay off debts, you're believing to get into college, university, you're believing for a scholarship, you've been told that this can never happen, I just want you to know that our Savior, our Messiah, our King of Kings, the Son of God, the Lord of Lords, He is already right there waiting for you to join Him in faith so that you in believing can see what He wants to do through your situation to bring Him glory and that others might believe in Him. So if you're here this morning, and you're like, I want my faith ignited. Get up to your seat because we are going to trust the Holy Spirit now. You're here and you're saying, I want my faith ignited for miracles. I'm believing God for a miracle. Let me tell you what's going to happen. God is not only going to ignite faith, but he's actually going to do miracles in your life. God is doing something on the earth. He's man See, God's glory is the manifestation of his excellence on the earth. And so what he's doing is those difficult situations, he's like prime, fertile ground for me to show my goodness that a man can believe that I am God. Raise up your hands for me. Let's pray together. Oh, Holy Ghost. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you do what you do? We bow to you right now. We submit to your will and to your word and to your way. And we ask you, King of glory, Lord of lords,
Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Tiskanu, the one that is the author and the finisher of our faith, the beginning and the end, and understands the middle, the one God that executes the plan and the purposes of God, the one that calls us his masterpiece, his handiwork. God, we thank you that you do not abandon us. You have not forgotten us. And right now, together in faith, we ask you, Holy Ghost, ignite our faith. Holy Spirit, ignite our faith. We ask for your word, oh God. We ask for your word, a refreshing word. We want to see you as the resurrection and the life. We want to see you as King of Kings. Lord, manifest your glory. I prophesy, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that every womb that is closed be opened according to the perfect will of God. In the mighty name of Jesus, every dead relationship, every irreparable relationship, oh God, that is not reconciled, I pray your reconciliation in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask God, we call all of the children that we're believing for that have chosen to walk away from you in the north, in the south, in the east, in the west. We call them right now before you. We say great is their peace because they are taught of the Lord. They will stand as pillars in your house. They will glorify your name. Even right now in the name of Jesus, wherever they are, we ask God for your miracle. Give us your faith. We receive your faith. Good God, we thank you for your word and blessing us to believe you, to sustain your word in us. God, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.